people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The United States has cleared air around the alleged differences between Washington and New Delhi after India's continuous purchase of oil from Russia amidst protracting Russia-Ukraine war. The US, which referred to the talks between Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and US President Joe Biden as constructive, said that New Delhi was in no violation of US sanctions. Meanwhile, Indian Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar called out the selectivity of the global media houses, citing that it was letting off European countries for the same thing it was singling out India for. The Russia-Ukraine war has entered eighth week and the world continues to gaze from the sidelines. Sanctions over Russia and coercive diplomacy have not been able to put a stop to the conflict that has taken a massive toll on civilians in Ukraine. All Ukraine has witnessed in the past few weeks is buildings turning into rubble and people either leaving their homes or dying a horrific death. In the backdrop of this plummeting situation, the leaders of two biggest democracies, India and the United States, held a virtual dialogue this week. US President Joe Biden and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's talks focused primarily on Ukraine. The talks took place as the United States seeks more help from India in applying economic pressure on Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Modi said he had suggested to Russia that President Vladimir Putin hold direct talks with the Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky. इस पूरे घटनाक्रम के दौरान मैंने यूक्रेन और रूस दोनों के राष्ट्रपतियों से कई बार फोन पर बातचीत की मैंने न सिर्फ शांति की अपील की बल्कि मैंने राष्ट्रपति पुतिन को यूक्रेन के राष्ट्रपति के साथ सीधी बातचीत का सुझाव भी रखा Over the past few weeks, India has tried to balance its ties with Russia and the West, but unlike other members of the Quad countries, United States, Japan and Australia, it has not imposed sanctions on Russia. And while the US media has tried to peddle a narrative where it has vilified India for maintaining its strategic stance, Washington came up with a clear statement saying that nothing had impacted the Indo-US ties and the meeting too was constructive. Biden told Modi he's looking forward to seeing him in Japan on about the 24th of May. The United States and India are going to continue our close consultation on how to manage the destabilizing effects of this Russian war. And I'm looking forward to our discussions today, Mr. Prime Minister. Our continued consultation and dialogue are key to ensuring the U.S.-Indian relationship continues to grow deeper and stronger. However, the interesting turn of events was witnessed post 2 plus 2 dialogue where India busted the global media's reportage as conjunctures and selectivity have been the basis of their stories on Indian interests in the past few weeks. Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jay Shankar explicitly expressed that India knew what it was doing and all it wanted was peace. While the international community with the support of international media has been spinning the narrative that India has somehow been supporting Russia, Jay Shankar called out that it was Europe which was doing more oil deals with Russia than India. Now, uh, as Secretary Blinken has pointed out, we have made uh, a number of statements which outline our position uh, in the UN, in our parliament, and in other forums. And briefly, 
what those positions state is that we are against the conflict. We are for dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, we are for uh, urgent cessation of violence. Uh, and we are prepared to contribute in whatever way to these objectives. Uh, I noticed you refer to oil purchases. Uh, if you are looking at energy purchases from Russia, I would suggest that your attention should be focused on Europe, which probably uh, we do buy some uh, uh, energy which is necessary for our energy security. But I suspect looking at the figures, probably uh, our total purchases for the month would be less than what Europe does in an afternoon. India has bought around 13 million barrels of Russian crude oil since Russia offered steep concessions. Following it, received coercive and ostracizing actions from the West. However, the news that hasn't reached the common masses is that it is the West that has increased its Russian oil demands in the past few weeks. So clearly, it is a narrative battle which some countries believed until Jay Shankar exposed them as their forte. And New Delhi has only firmed its position, saying it will do everything that suits its strategic interests and meets its energy security. However, Indian stance, as history and presence suggests, has never been even remotely close to violence, unlike others who preach what they never practice. Moving on, Pakistan has a new Prime Minister now. After months of opposition campaign followed by a no-confidence motion, Imran Khan has been ousted as country's premier and replaced by former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's brother, Shehbaz Sharif. The development comes amid former PM Imran Khan's charges that some external powers with ulterior motives were trying to destabilize Pakistan, an acquisition that has been refuted by both Shehbaz's government and the country's powerful military. Meanwhile, the experts have said that the new government faces massive challenges in front of it as Pakistan is going through its lowest point in economy with unprecedented inflation staring. Pakistan's Shahbaz Sharif was sworn in as the country's prime minister, officially taking charge of the country after Imran Khan was ousted in a midnight no confidence motion. The oath was administered by the chairman of Pakistan Senate, Sadiq Sanjrani, in the absence of President Arif Alvi, a member of Khan's party, who said he was unwell. Earlier in the day, Sharif won the support of 174 legislators out of 342 member house in a parliamentary vote to elect a replacement for Khan. Sharif, the 23rd Prime Minister of Pakistan, has now formed a new government that can remain in place until August 2023 when general elections are due. Contrasting scenes surface from different parts of the country as some celebrated Khan's downfall, others cried conspiracy behind his departure. Sharif received congratulatory messages from world over, including from Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, to which Sharif replied that he wanted a positive relationship with India. Meanwhile, the experts in the country said Sharif may have won the mandate, but it comes with massive responsibility as the country is going through turbulent times when the economy is in bad shape and the future doesn't appear promising. Pakistan has been in massive debt with its friendly allies or international bodies bailing it out several times in past few years. Inflation has spiked to one of the highest levels. The new government, they said, was also required to prove legitimacy. The first challenge of Pakistan, that is how to manage the economy. Pakistan economy is in, is in really bad shape. Uh, we see huge trade deficit. We see that uh, there's been an erosion of foreign exchange reserves. The rupee is tumbling down. The energy sector crisis is uh, intensifying. So this government idly should take some unpopular decisions to fix the economy. 
Meanwhile, responding to the charges leveled by former Prime Minister Imran Khan of US behind his ouster, the military spokesperson refuted the allegations. वो जो इनपुट है वो दे दी गई है जैसे मैंने कहा इलामिये के अंदर बड़े वाजे अल्फाज में लिखा हुआ है कि क्या था और क्या नहीं था उसके ऊपर आप वाजे तौर पर देख सकते हैं अगर कहीं अगर उधर कॉन्स्परेंसी का लफज है क्या उस इलामिये में मेरा नहीं ख्याल नाउ पाकिस्तानीज आर पिनिंग देयर होप्स ऑन द न्यू गवर्नमेंट ऑल दे लुक फॉर इज अ ट्रबल फ्री लाइफ विद लो इन्फ्लेशन रेट मोर एम्प्लॉयमेंट एंड अ बेटर लाइफ स्टाइल the hope that sharif who came to power on the plank of accusing the former pm of economic mismanagement will definitely bring things back on the right track moving on sri lanka is now grappling with two situations one the forex crisis and two the protests that have erupted due to the crisis people have started camping outside the presidential office as they demand gotabaya rajapaksa's resignation people say the economic mismanagement by the rajapaksa's is the real reason behind the current situation of people of sri lanka and they needed to pave way for a more competent authority meanwhile neighboring india sent large consignments of rice sugar under the 1 billion dollar line of credit to help island nation in the middle of the crisis As anger spirals across the island nation, Sri Lankans have started erecting tents outside the presidential office in Colombo, expressing both their helplessness and to raise their demand for the ouster of the government. Anti-government, especially anti-Rajapaksa slogans, can be heard in the backdrop as protesters tread through their daily chores and prepare and consume meals. they say they are not going to move until the situation improves which according to them is only going to get better after the rajapaksa resign the camp is expanding in size by the day and experts fear this could turn into another issue if the government doesn't come up with a solution immediately we are like we try to give the message like uh, until you guys going home we are stay we are staying we are not going home we are stay here and we are doing protest that's why we are trying to tell like until you guys and government president and all the bagas are going home we also stay here and we are doing our protest the intent of the demonstrators could be reflected in the determination that has made them brave the atmospheric hurdles including rain and police assertiveness that has been trying all measures to contain the numbers protesters are angry and accuse the rajapaksa family of economic mismanagement mahinda rajapaksa the president's elder brother serves as prime minister and their younger brother basil was finance minister until recently The administration says it is doing what it can to drag Sri Lanka out of a crisis that has left it unable to buy fuel and medicine and struggling to pay its debts. Mahinda Rajapaksa had earlier said in a televised address that the protests were hampering attempts to improve the situation. Some protesters said they would only leave if the Rajapaksa stepped down. The whole country is together. so he has to step down as a human being he should so the whole country you can see here right now as a, as a, i am a mother i have two kids now they are at home i am here on behalf of them also not only my kids there are a lot of kids who are next generation we are fighting for them as well this is not a fight actually we are asking for our rights please do that The island nation of 22 million people is in the throes of its worst financial crisis since independence in 1948 with a foreign currency shortage stalling imports of fuel and medicines and bringing hours of power cuts a day. 
Sri Lanka is about to default on its debts. Two of the world's largest credit rating agencies have warned. Fitch Ratings lowered its assessment of the South Asian nation, saying a sovereign default process has begun. SNP Global Ratings made a similar announcement and said that a default is now a virtual certainty. Colombo has been asking India and China for credit lines, food and energy. The Asian giants have already committed billions of dollars in financial support. India sent ships with sugar, rice and wheat to Sri Lanka. A rice shipment of 7,000 metric tons from India as a part of its $1 billion credit line to Sri Lanka reached the crisis hit neighbour. The rice is a part of the deal for essential commodities to be sent to Sri Lanka from its northern neighbour that will also include industrial raw material, pharmaceuticals and animal feeds. The country says it will also secure bailout funds from global bodies including the IMF and World Bank. But as of now, people are reeling and that seems to be the only and the only major takeaway from the country's crisis this week. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Rubble and ashes overlooked by a single golden pagoda are almost all that remain of the wood and brick houses most people had built for themselves in the quiet riverside villages of Bin in the Buddhist heartland of central Myanmar. Bin is one of more than 100 villages partially or completely burned by Myanmar's military since the start of this year. It homes among more than 5,500 civilian buildings raised as troops try to suppress opposition to last year's coup, according to media reports collated by activist group Data for Myanmar. Dozens of satellite images supplied by US Earth Imaging Company Planet Labs and US Space Agency NASA show widespread torching of villages in the central part of the country. The photos, largely confirming the local media reports, are among the strongest evidence to date that the military is using widespread arson to step up its assault on resistance in the central Sagang region. Military attacks and arson have led to large-scale displacements. According to the United Nations, more than 52,000 people fled their homes in the last week of February alone. Asma Khalil, whose brother, an officer in Iraqi army, was killed by a war remnant. She says the more they disable IEDs, the more her pain goes away. The Swiss Foundation for Mine Action to Clear Minefields that each year caused deaths in Iraq has helped her start coping with the grief caused by her brother's passing away. During the past year, about 52 people were killed by war remnants, a statement by Iraq's Ministry of Environment read last month. According to UNICEF and OMAS, 519 children have been killed or maimed in Iraq due to explosive ordnance over the last five years. Since 2019, Khalil has worked with the FSD in northern Iraq, where improvised minefields laid by Islamic State not only cause potential lethal accidents, but also prevent local farmers from cultivating their land. KCO is renowned all over the world for manufacturing calculators. In Japan, scientific calculators are used in the classes of universities and technical colleges. KCO trains teachers and builds a pilot curriculum in Thailand education where scientific calculators are not used. KCO tries to use them for future maths education by receiving feedback from a student and teacher and verifying it. KCO is both a manufacturer and an educator. It aims to expand its coverage to other emerging countries as well. Mm -hmm. 
These tiny but talented bike riders are participants of the latest riding academy which was organized by Yamaha Motors in Japan. Children ride these small motorbikes which are driven by advanced driving techniques. Yamaha Riding Academy aims to make experience of joyful bike riding and education of safety. It has been 28 years all the children are accompanied by their parents. There is an intimate and mutual communication. During this event, primary school and junior high school students participated with their parents. Their mission is mastering motorbike riding in three hours teaching. Kids motorbike is improved, small and fitting to their capability. The instructor will teach the children three important points regarding safe driving, switch check, brake and safety check. With the support of their parents, children learn braking and driving one by one. In this lesson, children gradually increase the distance of their motorbikes. Children can see their parents sign and operate brake and accelerator. They could run around the course to their parents by accelerating, slowing down and controlling the brake. Yamaha Family Motorbike Academy is held around the world. These kids are trained to handle motorcycles very safely. These children will grow to become good and safe bikers. Moving on. Being an agrarian society, India celebrates a number of harvest festivals that form an integral part of the country's cultural legacy and over the centuries they have evolved in various forms. So today we'll take you to immerse in the festivities of two such harvest festivals, namely Bihu and Besakhi, that are observed with much vigour across different parts of the country. <laughs> As the country marks the arrival of spring, people across different states gear up to celebrate their harvest festivals with joy and merriment. In Assam, it is observed as Bohag or Rangoli Bihu that marks the end of the harvesting season in the region. Celebrating the beginning of Assamese New Year that starts with the month of Bohag, the merriment of Bihu goes on for about seven days. The first day of Bihu is known as Guru Bihu. It is dedicated to cattle and usually falls on the last day of the outgoing year. On this day, farmers take their cows to a pond or a river to give them a bath before applying a mahaldi made of turmeric powder and pulses onto them. This Bahak Mohina se naya saal hamlo ka salu hota hai. Aur naya saal aaj pehle hamlo subhe गोरु को हल्दी माँ हल्दी माँ मतलब माती माँ से और हल्दी से नहा वहाँ के सुबह लोग को पूरा सम्मान दे के इसके बाद हम लोग उसको पठार में हम लोग ले जाता है खेत में ले जाता है खेत का पठार में ले जाता है सब समुच्चय राज जितना हम लोग गांव बसी है गांव वाले सब एकता हो के हम वहाँ गोरु को वहाँ नहाता है गांव ढ और दूल्हा इसको पूजा पाठ करके उसको छोड़ देता है नया साल दे जैसे लोग का देह ठीक रहेगा गाय हम लोग का गोरु ठीक रहेगा गोरु ठीक रहेगा हम लोग का खेत ठीक रहेगा इसी मतलब से हम लोग का ये परंपरा मान चल रहा है बैसाखी इज अनदर हार्वेस्ट फेस्टिवल दैट इज मोस्टली ऑब्जर्व इन द नॉर्दर्न स्टेट्स ऑफ द कंट्री स्पेशली पंजाब एंड हरियाणा An ancient festival of Hindus and a new year for Sikhs, the festival commemorates the formation of Khalsa Panth of warriors under Guru Gobind Singh in 1699. On this day, people get together and perform Bhangra and Gidda on traditional folk songs and tolls. Today we are celebrating the name of Visakhiya. The name of Visakhiya is a Punjabi and a very proud of you. This day, we can say that we have a family of people who have been born in a family. That's why we have been born in a family. This day, we have been born in a family. When we have been born in a family, we have been born in a family. We have been born in a family. So, this is a very proud of you, Punjabi. For many Hindus, Baisakhi is an occasion to take a holy trip in sacred rivers like Ganges, Jhelum and Kaveri. At Haridwar's Harkipori Ghat, 
thousands of devotees gathered to take the early morning dip in Ganges water. Gurudwara across the country are also beautifully decorated on Baisakhi. At Golden Temple in Amritsar, one can also watch a splendid display of firecrackers that fill the night sky over the holy site. Known by different names and celebrated in different ways across the country, Harvest Festivals beautifully showcase the beauty of India and its diverse culture and traditions. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.